We are now joined by a former Senator Antonio Trillanes to talk more about his uh, declaration that he would run for president next year. Good morning, Senator Trillanes, and thank you very much for joining us this morning. Well, good morning, Christian. Okay, is this a serious uh, proposition or declaration that indeed you would run for president next year if Vice President Len Robredo would not take on the challenge? Most definitely, Christian, because uh, uh, as I've said in uh, several interviews, that we cannot lose by default. If uh, Vice President Lenny Robredo uh, decides to run for a local uh, post, then uh, there would be no one else from the opposition uh, who would take her place. So this uh, move that I made um, in, uh, in Sambayan would qualify me to be included in the selection process. So all of these are contingent, again, on her decision. And uh, once uh, she definitively decides to run, then I would uh, wholeheartedly uh, step aside, as I mentioned in my message, and uh, withdraw my candidacy in her favor. But can you win? Do you think you can win in 2022? Well, it's in the hands of uh, the electorate. Uh, I would be presenting myself as one of the alternatives and uh, it's going to be a long campaign. We would have enough time to win over uh, the hearts and minds of the people and uh, convince them that we're offering uh, the best uh, program of government, uh, the best uh, alternative for our country and uh, people. So uh, the power in a democracy uh, resides in the voter. So, we we'll just have to see. Why did you decide to make this declaration at this time? Um, well, it was uh, triggered by uh, the confluence of events, um, and uh, the latest one being the, the act of uh, Vice President Lenny Guevedo to transfer her residence uh, from Naga City to um, a, a town outside Naga, and that would qualify her to run for um, uh, governor uh, of Camarines Sur. Uh, again, these are uh, for those uh, who have run a public, public office before, these are requisites, these are preparations. And that's what I meant. Uh, and I believe uh, Attorney Barry Gutierrez uh, probably wasn't privy to these uh, things. And it would have been more prudent for him to ask, to ask uh, her prince, his principal first before uh, issuing such a general denial, because everybody knows that. Yeah, because that was a lingering uh, discussion. Uh, there's a lot of talk regarding that that she would uh, go for the uh, that position of governor in Camarines Sur, but uh, officially, according to her spokesman, she has not made up her mind yet whether to run for governor or to run for president. That's why I'm curious about the timing of your declaration. To be honest about it, or to be blunt about it, is this declaration of uh, yours meant to put pressure on the vice president to take on the challenge to run for president next year and abandon whatever plans she has of running for governor in Camarines Sur? Okay, first, uh, let me address the first part of your, uh, your question. I was clear in my statement that in view of the preparations being made by uh, Vice President Lenny Rivera. I didn't say that in view of her decision to run. And uh, those are clearly uh, different things. Uh, the act of uh, transferring your uh, place of residence is uh, the first step in, the, in that uh, uh, eventual run for, or probable run for uh, governorship. And that is part of the preparation uh, process. Now, uh, as to the second part, definitely uh, this move is not to pressure Vice President Lenny Robredo in any way. This is uh, a requirement by the Sambayan coalition because they are about to start the selection process. And uh, I need to change my status from being an alternate to to that of uh, being a principal in order for me to, to be included in that uh, selection process. Were you not included 
at the start? Um, as an alternate, you cannot be included because for as long as the principal, who is uh, Vice President Penny Rivero, is still there, um, then you cannot be uh, qualified or you cannot be included. And uh, in the scenario that, um, for example, uh, the Zambayan coalition decides to choose VP uh, Lenny to be the standard bearer, and uh, in, Hypothet or uh, if she declines that nomination because of her decision to run for governor, then we would we wouldn't have um, any other uh, candidate left to be chosen. At least those uh, purely coming from the opposition. Well, why is that? That is quite interesting. The thing that you said: if she doesn't run for president next year, no one else. That's why you're taking on the challenge. You're presenting yourself. Actually, you are exposing yourself at this stage. Why is that? Uh, okay, uh, because last March when uh, the Isambayan coalition was there, they pre-qualified uh, some uh, prospective candidates and I was included in that uh, uh, initial selection. So they interviewed um, the five of us, and uh, only two were open to run for for president. Wait, who were the and, five who were interviewed? Uh, Senators Grace Po, Nancy Binay, um, Mayor Isco Moreno, Vice President Lenny Robredo, and myself. And aside from you, who was the other person who was open to running for president? No. Um, when I was interviewed, I manifested uh, that position that I am only, uh, I would only be an alternate of Vice President uh, Robredo because precisely we needed to unify the position. Now, uh, the other one uh, is uh, Isco Moreno. So I think uh, Senators Grace Po and Senator Nancy B9, uh, both of them uh, declined. Uh, when they were asked if they intend to run for president. So that left uh, only two of them, uh, is Mayor Isco Moreno and uh, Vice President Lenny Robredo. So in the event that uh, VP Lenny would, would decline the nomination, then therefore by default, uh, that position would go to Mayor Isco Moreno. Uh, but uh, we feel that the opposition should uh, be given a chance to uh, uh, rep to be represented in that uh, process. Okay, another interesting uh, point that you mentioned, true opposition, meaning the candidate of Isambayan should be a true member of the opposition or part of the true opposition. Just, put, just to put things in perspective, uh, is this your way of saying that you don't want the standard better or the candidate of Isambayan to be someone who also somehow benefited from the Duterte administration and out of perhaps political convenience would now consider running under the banner of Isambayan. That's why you're making use of that point. It has to be true opposition. Uh, most definitely, um, because uh, all of us in the opposition uh, knew the, the difficulty of the struggle the past five years in trying to inform the public uh, about what's happening to this uh, uh, administration. Uh, most of us or all of us were, uh, were persecuted by uh, this administration. Now, these uh, Johnny's come lately, so to speak, uh, are just being opportunistic because of the changing political tides. Uh, they're suddenly switching or shifting alliances. And uh, it shows uh, uh, I believe uh, it is duplicitous in, uh, in in nature. And we don't want that because we we already have it in Mr. Duterte. He has been duplicitous from the very start. And uh, now uh, it's only now that a lot of people are realizing. Would you consider Manila Mayor Isco Moreno as a Johnny Com lately in case he is considered or picked as the Isambayan candidate for president? Uh, well, the thing is, uh, he has yet to 
break away even from uh, uh, President Duterte. And in fact, they are openly courting the endorsement of uh, Mr. Duterte for 2022. And uh, I believe until such a time that he genuinely breaks away from Mr. Duterte, uh, it should only be the time that he would be considered by uh, a coalition such as Isambayan. How about Senator Manny Pacquiao? We know that he's part of PDP Laban, but lately he has been issuing statements that could be construed as something that we're going against the official line of the president. Would you uh, also consider him, if considered by Isambayan, as a possible candidate for president? Would you also consider him as a Johnny Come Lately? Okay, um, I, I won't I won't go there yet because uh, I think that will be immaterial at this point because um, as I understand, the Senator Pacquiao uh, wasn't considered by uh, Isambayan in the initial selection process. So um, I, I wouldn't be in a position to make a statement. Okay. Now I'd like to I'd like you to respond to uh, this uh, initial round of criticisms that you have been getting after you made that announcement that you would run for president again if uh, Vice President Leonardo Bredo won't take on the challenge. Uh, these criticisms are also coming from within, from the opposition. You've been described as someone who's quite excited, perhaps even messianic. How do you respond to this? That somehow you, your decision to make this announcement at this time might further divide the opposition instead of uniting it. Okay. Um, you know, Christian, um, when I entered this uh, field of politics, I began to embrace that notion that you can you cannot win over everybody. Uh, there will be criticisms from all sides, and uh, this one that, that you cited is uh, uh, coming from the position. And I just need to to accept that and just uh, continue to present myself, import myself the way I've been doing so the past uh, 20 years or 18 years when I uh, first joined this field in, back in 2003, if you can include that. Uh, so uh, I won't be able to, to convince them otherwise that this is just how I, I serve uh, the public and I serve my country. Okay. I've been consistent with that, uh, and uh, I've been straightforward. If I say I, I'm going to run, then that's just it. There's no hidden agenda. Uh, now, it's very clear in my statement that I'm willing to step aside the moment Vice President Lenny Robredo definitively decides to run for, for president. And um, I don't see how you would be able to spin that as uh, dividing. Okay. Um, can To be honest about it, can Vice President Lenny Robredo, given what's happening now, uh, given what has been happening since 2016, can she really afford not to take on that challenge to be the opposition's candidate for president in 2022? And number two, do you think her seeming reluctance, at least based on what we're seeing publicly, do you think this could work to her advantage or disadvantage later on during the campaign if indeed she decides to run? Because you know that reluctance is also part of the uh, arsenal of candidates in tinatawag nating pakipot politics, diba? which we saw in 2016. But do you think this could actually work in the case of Vice President Leonardo Bredo? Okay. Um, first, I believe that uh, VP, only VP Lenny would know what she went through the past uh, I do so. And that's why uh, we're giving her a lot of space to go through her decision-making process. Because um, running for president is, is not easy. Uh, as you mentioned, you're trying to magnet all the political attacks uh, once you decide and once you eventually declare. Um, so uh, I'm going to respect that. Uh, none of us would would have the right to to say that uh, she she can afford this or, or that so we we'll just have to leave her to that uh, decision making process now as to whether it would be disadvantageous or disadvantageous 
on my end, uh, coming from the military, who gives a premium on leadership, uh, I would look at this as a negative because uh, it shows some um, indecisiveness, uh, which is called for uh, in these very trying times. Remember, we're not only talking about the campaign here. We're talking about a post-Duterte governance. You would be facing all these ki kinds of problems. And um, if uh, you are wishy-washy, then uh, we can only imagine what kind of governance would, would happen after. Now, I'm not concluding that yet uh, uh, with the vice president because um, what I'm saying is once she decides, if ever that happens, then it has to be uh, a constant stream of uh, decisiveness from then on. It cannot be a difficult uh, decision process to decide whether you're running or not. And then after that, all decisions will be go going through that same kind of uh, deliberate uh, uh, decision-making process. I, I don't think uh, it's, going, it's going to work for a country. But in your case, are you actually laying the groundwork now for this presidential run that you announced yesterday? Because I think you're, you're, you were considered in one report as one of the uh, top spenders on social media as far as advertising is concerned. So you are laying the groundwork for, for 2022. Is that correct? Okay. First and foremost, I'm a private citizen. Uh, I'm teaching right now. And I last year when we had this interview, uh, I said that uh, the, the group, uh, uh, my group, uh, the Magdalos, have decided that uh, we will participate again in 2020. So because of my um, lack of uh, uh, awareness, public awareness, it's just uh, the first step in increasing the awareness to the public again, uh, being reintroduced to the public again. And that's mm -hmm. different. Now, aside from that, we the only way for us to, to break the algorithm of uh, social media is to boost posts that um, that would expose uh, the Duterte administration. And if you would look at that same article, we have been boosting the posts against uh, Duterte, particularly those issues that would would uh, show the, the different uh, corruption incidents in this uh, Duterte administration. Now, as a candidate, in case you indeed go for it, uh, what would be, what will you, what would you bring to the table? Um, I've been hearing comments like this uh, also on social media, saying that um, perhaps Senator Antonio Trillanes or former Senator Antonio Trillanes uh, is indeed clean, quote unquote, because despite everything that he has been saying against President Duterte, despite all the dirt thrown at him by this administration, you're still free. You're still not in jail. Is that the right way of looking at it? Uh, well, uh, definitely, yes, because uh, since 2003, um, we have entered this political field in an anti-corruption crusade. So the only way that you would maintain your credibility is you have to be free from any uh, uh, stains of uh, corruption yourself. And that, that's how, that's the only way you'd be able to speak out against corruption. Because these people in power, the people uh, that I, uh, I have been opposing uh, from the time of Jimmy, these are very powerful people and they have access to all sorts of information. So if you have uh, dirt yourself, they hold you hostage. But uh, if you're free from such uh, dirt, then you can fire away, uh, fire, uh, fire away and pursue your uh, anti-corruption advocacy. Okay. Let's go to the second issue that is also very um, disturbing. Definitely controversy. The statements by the president um, seemingly uh, denigrating the, uh, the value of our arbitral victory over China in 2016. And of course, number two is a statement claiming that um, the jet ski, 
promise he made in 2016 in response to a fisherman's question was just a joke. Now, in the in the course of these conversations, of these debates, um, the, the 2012 Scarborough uh, show standoff is often uh, mentioned. And of course, during that time, you were uh, tapped by the Aquino administration to do back channel talks with China. Walk us through. Let's talk about that again, th those negotiations, and what exactly it did or didn't do uh, in terms of contribution or lack of it in the uh, ongoing standoff in 2012. What was indeed your participation there? Um, just to give a background to our viewers, back in April of 2012, we had a, a standoff in uh, Scarborough Shoal. Again, to clarify, Scarborough is different from Spratlys. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you for clarifying that. Uh, because even the president tends to misconstrue that, it seems. So Scarborough is the one of uh, the seas of Palawan. Now, back in April, um, the standoff is similar to the one we have right now in, in the Spratlys, wherein around 80 to 100 ships uh, swarmed Scarborough Shoal. Uh, so the Chinese were sitting on uh, on that uh, the territory of ours, and then after a month of uh, negotiations through the front channel, uh, which is the, the DFA, they had an impasse and the uh, tension was escalating. At some point, nagkatutukan nga ng baril na dyan, so it was very, very tense. So at that point, the, the president, uh, President Aquino, uh, decided to use the foreign policy tool of back channeling, and I was stopped as uh, the negotiator. So, from 80 to 100 ships during that uh, impasse, we were able to reduce it down to three. And there is no reclamation there. Um, they can check it. So, I believe um, the back channel negotiations work in as far as de escalating the situation and drastically reducing the number of ships uh, of China. So, but from in that, the uh, mm, yeah. Mm, but in the end, yeah. yeah, but in the end, China has been there since 2012. And this is often thrown against the previous administration by President Duterte saying that, uh, why did you guys leave? Why did the Philippine vessels leave despite a supposed commitment from both sides that there would be mutual withdrawal as brokered supposedly by the United States? So looking back, do you think that was a mistake? Did, did okay, the Aquino uh, administration make a strategic mistake at that time? I Well, first, the that negotiation brokered by the Americans that you're referring to, I'm not privy to that. Okay. Uh, that it came after your back channel, right? Uh, I believe it, it came earlier. Earlier, so before they, your back channel? I, I believe so. Because, uh, look, if they're saying that uh, the, the Chinese didn't leave, then how come um, there are no more ships in inside the show? And that was the primary issue. Back then, uh, there were around uh, 30 to 40 fishing boats inside Scarborough, plus uh, another 40 dinghies and uh, around 17 um, Coast Guard ships outside the show. So, after the back channel negotiations, all of these ships inside the shoal left and the Coast Guard ships from 17, it was reduced to three. And at that point, when uh, President Aquino uh, wanted uh, uh, them to leave, uh, when they refused, when China refused, and that forced the hand of President Aquino to file the arbitration case, which we won. Okay, and uh, that those are the facts. There is no more tension there. We were able to, to do that. Now, as to the remaining ships, the question back to Mr. Duterte is, who is stopping you from sending uh, our ships there? Because um, the Scarborough is still there. There is no reclamation there. China cannot claim that they are in possession of, uh, of um, Scarborough. They're just lying to uh, outside. And we can also do that if we want to reassert our ownership. But, but this President Duterte has been saying that China is in possession of the West Philippine Sea. Although yesterday, Secretary Panelo claimed that the President was just referring to the Scarborough Shoal. But even then, that was quite disturbing for the President to make that admission repeatedly 
and publicly, don't you think? Uh, definitely. All these statements of uh, Mr. Duterte is uh, um, surrendering basically the national interest and sovereignty of uh, the country. And uh, But uh, these statements can be undone. Believe me, um, once these people are out of office, the new president can issue the new foreign policy position as regards the West Philippine Sea. And all of these statements of Mr. Duterte can be undone. Okay. Um, but I believe right now, it's very clear to to the Filipinos who really sold out to the Chinese. Um, and that is uh, no other than uh, Mr. Duterte. Okay. Former Senator Antonio Trillanes IV, thank you for joining us this morning, sir. Salamat, sir.